My name's Steve Wraith. I'm here at Portofino's restaurant in Newcastle and I meet a very special man, Albert Sears. And this is at Baraboy's Tale. Albert, tell us a little bit about you know your, your early life, where you were born and where you were brought up. Well, I was born in Newcastle, real Geordie, <laughs> although I don't speak like a Geordie. But we were born in Newcastle, I was born on Blanford Street, which is now Blanford Square. And um, all the family were born there, yeah, yeah. All street trading family, you know. Um, father came up from London, from the East End of London. And... Um, my mother's people were originally from Ireland, you know? So the, both families were in the, uh, buying and selling the fruit trade, basically. So it was like a meeting of two dynasties, you know? So that's the way we were brought up. And, you know, there, there were tough days, basically. Really, really tough days. But for me there were better days you know because people sort of um just a different world you know but uh, there were good days i remember sort of from a very very early age my old man said to me look you've got to go out and get your living you know what i mean and it's difficult very difficult for uh, a person to have to go to work with no education because we didn't, we didn't. What, what education did we get? You know, we went to school. In the school that I went to, St. Allah Wishes, um, there was only two things come out of Allah Wishes. You either got a good thief, a good burglar, or you got a good footballer. And um, I think there was one kid I ended up playing for, for England, Jimmy Mullins, I think, before my time. And there was another kid who won the Victoria Cross, which wasn't bad for kids from all environment. But just rough and ready kids, you know. Um, learning to survive and survive um, has always been part of my life, you know. Just how to survive. Um, it applied to all my family, you know. We just had to go there and get a few shillings and, and live the life we, we live, you know, really. Did you have a big family? Did you have brothers and sisters? Yeah, I had um, three brothers and one sister. Frankie, John, Peter and Sylvia. And um, Frankie was the older brother. And uh, Frank was like a role model, you know. He was... Um, a very, very nice guy. Tough, tough guy, but not, you know, not a bully. You know, you, you see a lot of these guys today, very tough, but the bullies, you know, and something I hate above anything is a, is a guy who's a bully. Frankie was a nice guy, could fight. He could fight, all right, and um, had a lot of respect. And of course, in, in the street, the, the street life, the world that I know, the most important thing that you can obtain is um, for respect. Respect is everything. It's more than money. It's more than anything else. If you can get that respect on the streets, it's, um, it's a very, very important thing. Frank did have that respect and... Um, Unfortunately, he died in 2000, yeah, 2000, but um, he's a miss, you yeah. know. Yeah, and what about John and, and Peter? Well, we were, you know, like our families were very, very close, connected, you know. Um, of course, I was the baby, so <laughs> I was just a little bit away from them. But um, John, you know, they were all good money getters. John was more into the more into the manual scrap buying and selling cars and whatever, you know, um, than Frankie and I and Peter used to work the barriers more, but John was more into scrap and things like that, you know, but 
we all got a living, you know, all, mm. all survived and all got a living. Peter was a clever kid, Peter. Um, he worked the barrows and then he went into the car business. They've all been pretty successful, you know. Um, probably I'm the least successful one of the lot because I'm still, still on the barrel till I was 70 year old. <laughs> So I don't know if that's a success story or not. But, well, there's um, nothing wrong with that. Um, I was there and I did it, you know. So um, the problem we had with the barras and street trading um, is, believe it or not, and most people don't understand that um, street, street trading was illegal up till 1981. And you could actually be arrested for selling on the streets. And that would apply all over England, I would imagine. Um, so we had a history, a, a great history of um, being on the streets and getting nicked by the old bill. And um, my granny Mariah, who's a fantastic character, you know, she's part of the folklore of Newcastle. Um, she had... Um, seven daughters and one son. My mother was one of the daughters, Liza. And um, she went to prison in 1935 fighting for legalization of the, uh, of the, of the barrels, you know. I remember 35 going into prison for a woman, horrific. I mean, even to the 50s and 60s, prison was a bad place to go, you know, any of these old guys that I've spoken to who, who went through that system. It was bad then, but can you imagine in the 30s for a woman? And most of my aunties, they all went to prison fighting for legalization. So like, uh, it was a family tradition, you know? Um, if you went out there and you were on the barrows and you were selling fruit or whatever you were selling, you got nicked. And if you didn't pay the fines, they sent you to prison. And it, People just don't un understand how bad that situation was, that people who were trying to get an honest living could be put in prison, you know? Um, but that, that was the way the system was. So our family's always been sort of different. I would describe um, the people that we are as a tribe and if you go back in American history and you've got the Indians and you've got different tribes and they have different cultures and they have different beliefs. Um, the tribe that I come from is the same tribe that you have in London, Manchester, Leeds, all same kind of people, all same kind of environment. Kids who were brought up rough and ready, couldn't read or write really, just basics and had to go out and get money. So with my family, it was a, the story was like, everybody sort of defied the law by saying, look, we're gonna go out there and get a living. It's an honest living and just let, let us live. I mean, if you look to 1948, rules and regulations, the system, how it works in the, the system for me, um, is not very good. I never. I'm. I'm not a lover of the system, or authority. You know. Um, but I mean, it, it was 1948 before the, before they allowed a black man to fight for the British title. One of the Turpin brothers won the British title. But it was 1948 before they allowed a black man to fight for the title, and that's what the laws and rules and regulations were like in those days. They were hard, very, very harsh. You know, um, how did you start off? You know, working on the barrows. Obviously, it's in your family. So, so can you yeah. can you remember your first day? I can't remember my first day, but I can always remember um, mm. being involved. You know, um, in those days, the fruit market was in St Andrew Street, coming down Gallagher into St Andrew Street. That was the old Newcastle, and. Um, I remember being with my old man when I was about 10 year old and on a Saturday he would take me down the market with him, you know, and um, 
great atmosphere, you know, the summer market, you could smell the strawberries and the peaches and all those smells, all those sounds take me back. And um, my old man would be dealing with the, with the wholesalers, you know, trying to buy um, the fruit as cheap as you could so you could earn more money selling it, obviously. So there was a lot of bartering got done, you know. And if you knew the right people, and um, you could straighten them up a little bit, you know, giving them a bung, you know, which they all used to take. <laughs> so you got your bananas a little bit cheaper than anybody else, you know. But um, from about the age of 10, I remember 10 or 12, and my old man said, look, I'll tell you what you've got to do, Albert, you've got to, you've got to go to your own business. So I started my own business when I was 12, and what I did, in those days, we used to sell brown craft carrier bags. Today, the plastic, but in those days, they were brown, brown bags with a white string along the top. The older people would remember them. So what I used to do, I used to buy myself two or three hundred carrier bags, and um, two of my aunties, three of my aunties, me, me dad's sisters had pictures in the big market. Big market it was a fantastic market at the time. So I dropped a hundred carrier bags off to Modi and a hundred off to Lily and a hundred off somewhere else. So already I've done three, three hundred carrier bags, and then I'd go on the street corner and sell them for whatever we used to sell them at a tanner or something. What is that equivalent? They had done a two and a half pence. And the day I got myself a five, and oof, dear me, you're rich. So my old man said, no, now you're earning money, you've got to buy your own clothes. So that's what I used to do. So from an, from an early age, believe it or not, I was one of the youngest kids ever to have a suit handmade by Jackson's and Taylor's. Because my old man knew the manager in there, and he said, I want you to make my boy a suit. He says, we don't make suits for kids, you know. So I want you to make one for him. So by about 15, I was a little dapper kid, with a little suit on with the patch pockets, you know, a little dandy. But then, then it went on that I started um, working with some of my older relations, you know, like the Kelly boys and um, Billy and Georgie and them and my brother Peter, and, and we started crafting the barriers, you know. Um, Nelson Street used to be one of our main pictures. And in Nelson Street in those days, you'd have 15 barrows. Wow. 15. And everybody got a living. Everybody got a living. Those were the days before the supermarkets, of course. So. Was that mainly fruit? Fruit, yeah, yeah. But sometimes we used to alternate during the Christmas time because um, Christmas time was good selling fruit in those days, but like I remember um, me old man bringing a lot of calendars up from London because he had a lot of contacts in London, you know? Excuse me. And um, we got into selling these beautiful little calendars with a glass glass front. And we, used, we got, what? Just telling them for a tissue around half a crown, you know? Um, but there was always little things like that happening, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so it was hard, it was very, very hard, but in them days the game was easier because you didn't have supermarkets. And in the summer when we used to sell English strawberries, which was a fantastic time of the year for us, um, I remember, you, you know, you could pull your bar out with the strawberries and then all of a sudden, within 10 minutes, you had a big queue of people. Because it was only that time of the year they could buy strawberries of you. Mm -hmm. So business was good, you know. <laughs> the days of wine and roses. I remember it was very, very fun, <laughs> you know. Great, great days. And everybody was together, and the old Bill used to be coming running. Actually, it was comical because uh, the police in those days, they were, that was one of the main things that they did. They were obsessed 
with Nick and the street traders. Now you would think <laughs> in, in that time that they would have been more concerned about catching people who were doing things wrong, but they were very, very um, obsessed with Nick and street traders. So they, <clears throat> they used to do things like um, the, they'd stand in the doorway and take the hat off so you couldn't recognize them, you know, and say, you're nicked. And um, we used to get fined two quid in them days, I think. I remember two quid. Can you remember your first arrest? Or when you were? Yeah, I do. I do as it happens. Because some of these businesses were right, you know, they were right. Um, young boys on the beat. Mm -hmm. And the nick somebody was fantastic and they got the book out and they wrote your name down and your dress down. And, um, and then they'd get the Black Mariah up. Black Mariah was the, the police fan, as we used to call it. I don't know how we call it Black Mariah, but it, that's what we used to call it. And then they'd throw you into the back of the van. <laughs> they, weren't, they weren't easy with you as well. They used to give you, you know, <laughs> give you a, a right hand or a left hand, you know, and that was part of the game, you know. That's what they thought they were doing right. Obviously, they weren't. And then you went down to Pilgrim Street, they lock you up with four hours in the nick down there, and um, by the time you got out, your fruit had one dodgy, you know? So all, all of those yeah. things. Um, but, but we managed, we got by, you know? We got by, and um, as I say, I remember them days fondly. Is that where your dislike for, for the authority came from then, when you, know, when you were getting... Well... For, for essentially, just trying to make a living? It goes back further than that because um, I suppose in all families in all parts of of England, you have families who have a name, you know, um, for whatever reason. But the Sears family always had a um, a name because we we looked after ourselves and we didn't stand for any nonsense of anybody, you know. So. I suppose notoriety is the evil twin to fame, as I've always said. Um, and plus, you know, we um, we were looked on as the criminal class. If you were a barra boy or a street trader, even today, people look down on you and say, oh, they've got to be a little bit iffy. You know, they're not, they can't be straight people, you know, because they're, they're slippery characters. And if you look at any of the... Uh, of any of the um, films, the old films, you see the spivs on the street corner, you know, or you see the Del Boy character, yeah. or the George Cole and Minder, which are programs which I really, really love because I could identify mm. with these people because I was the same kind of character. And I think the guy who wrote Fools and Horses actually looked at guys like me and thought, this is the character that we're going to have, because it was very, very, very true to life. All of, all of those programs, very funny comedies, black comedies, really, but very, very funny. And to think that was the way we had to get a life. I mean, one of the things that I knew from a very, very early age that I was exceptionally good at at selling um, and you know I don't want to give myself any bouquets but I was very very good I could um, I could sell a pound of apples or I could sell a diamond ring or I could sell a car or I could sell anything put it put it in front of me and I'll describe it and I'll sell it to the customer Sam of the Arabs Basically, and a lot of guys like me up and down the country because I, I work London, I work Oxford Street, I worked um, Portobello Road and uh, Chapel Street Market in Islington. So I was brought up and I got to know a lot of Cockneys, you know. And if you work with them, you had to be good yeah. at what you did. So from selling fruit, I got into the situation where. At Christmas time, when fruit was a little bit difficult to buy or hard to buy, as we say, or expensive to buy, 
I thought to myself, well, this is a game that I can do. So I used to go down to London, down to Barrack Street, which is the centre of um, Soho. I got to know Soho very well. I got to know a lot of people down there. And um, used to buy watches down there and come back and have a pitch on the street, you know? And you know what I mean by having a pitch? Yeah, yeah. First of all, you, you, what I used to do, which was my calling card, I always used to dress immaculately with a nice suit, collar and tie, which a lot of the kids who worked the streets didn't, you know? So the customer thought straight away, what is that guy doing there, sitting in the gutter, selling watches or pieces of jewellery? Interesting. I'll stop and listen to what he's got to say. And um, <laughs> they were good days, you know, great days. What kind of things were you selling? Everything. I could sell anything. Um, we used to sell jewellery, you know, um, not the best jewellery in the world, but it, by the time I'd finished, it was the best jewellery in the world it was from. It was from the Tower of London, the Crown Jewels. <laughs> and everybody went we were happy. So it was all about convincing, you know, but, like, I remember selling a ladies and gents watch, you know, to sell watches on the, on the street corner is very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I used to sell uh, ladies and gents watch for a tenner in those days. A tenner was a fortune. But I could do it, you know, I was good at the game. And a lot of people that I know were, mm -hmm. um, especially some of them London kids in Manchester Leeds, all very good workers. So that was part of it, you know, you sort of, sort of got up in the morning and you thought, what am I going to do today? How am I going to get a shilling? Ah, there's a little move there. Um, there was a time I remember when um, in the 70s we had problems with electricity and there was total blackouts. And we brought a load of candles up from London because you couldn't, you couldn't get lights. So we were selling the candles, you know. These big candles, and um, we used to get them. Just anything like that, you know, where, where there was an opening, a gap in the market, you know what I mean? Mm. So that was that was part of it, you know. But um, as I say, getting back to the um, illegal street trading, um, it went right through the 60s and the 70s, and... Um, the councils just wouldn't listen to us, basically. The police didn't want to listen, you know. It was just move them on, nick them. If they go to prison, they go to prison. So in the 70s, um, I decided that um, the traders should get together and we should form some kind of association or a union, which we did and we formed the Barra Traders Association, which was all kids who were trading illegally. You know, all families in the, in the city centre, like, um, and, you know, loads of families. I mean, I, I get credit for, if anybody says to you today, well, legalisation of pitches, the sale, but says, well, that, that isn't truly so, because I was the figurehead and I was in front, but there was a lot of families involved, like, um, the Kelly family and, and the Donnellys and the Quinns and young little Terry Milligan, who you know, um, uh, the Flower Girls, the Costello Girls, and um, uh, so many people that I can't, I can't mention their names, but some all different families. Anyway, we all get together and we, we form this association, which give us a bit of clout. You know, if you work in a body, it's much, much better, yeah. in my opinion. So that's what we did, and I was the, the mouthpiece, to say, or the spokesman is a better word to use. So we ended up getting some dialogue with the city council, and um, eventually you got some um, 
counselors up there who were, who were human beings instead of being monsters, you know, they wanted to listen to what we had to say. And they had sympathy for us um, because they knew we were hardworking people. So in 1981, we won the pools. We got legalization. And you know, people don't realize, but to be able to go to work without any harassment from the authorities, it was a fantastic, fantastic thing to do. Not because we were going to be millionaires or we were going to get a lot of money, but um, the fact was that we could get to work without, without any problems. We had, we had some counsellors who were very, very nice guys and they, they took the gauntlet up for us, basically. I remember Theresa Russell, who was the Lord Mayor in Newcastle, Benny Abrahams, Jewish people who were very, very nice to me. Um, maybe that was because I had a little bit of Jew in us, I don't know, but um, they were very good people, you know. Tom Yellily was another guy, and, and they said, look, let's, let's give these guys pitches because, you know, first of all, the money we were costing the taxpayer must have been immense because, first of all, you had to be the, the police presence and they had to nick you and then you had to go to court. And then if you didn't pay your fines, you went to non-payment courts. Mm. And then if you didn't pay there, you went to the nick. That was all costing money. So all they had to do was to use their brains and say, right, we'll give these people a license. The self-regulating, which we were self-regulating, it meant that when we got pitches, it did away with illegal street trading because we were the governors in the town. Nobody else worked illegally mm. when we were working. So it worked for us and it worked for the council. And um, in 1981, we got the pitches. So from then, they decided um, that they'd give pitches, say a person was working in Nelson Street, they give a pitch in Nelson Street. I was working on Northumberland Street, they give me a pitch in Savile Row. What a lovely address, Savile Row. Yeah. It, it even sounds posh, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so that was a G for me, but I got Savile Row. I don't know if they were trying to tell me something. Possibly, yeah. Maybe it's your London connections. Maybe, maybe. And um, f from then, it, it was it was nice, you know, it was good. But I, I still say to this day, um, uh, women have been a very strong influence in my life. And I'll tell you why, because my grandmother Mariah was a very, very strong woman. My mother was a strong woman. I married a beautiful girl, Margaret, who is a very, very strong woman. And um, my daughter, Margaret, a strong woman. They've always been influenced in, in uh, big influences in my life. And I think if it hadn't been for Margaret, I think I probably would have taken the other track and I would have probably ended up doing bird, you know, and mm -hmm. um, doing prison time. But she kept us right, you know, and um, you, you and you and Peter obviously and, and Sylvia did stay on the on, on the the graft, you know, the the hard track of work. But obviously Frankie and John went down well, the the other road, didn't they? Well, people said to me, Albert, you're 72 and you haven't got a conviction. And then some people say, either you were very clever or you were very lucky. And I think I was very lucky. Okay. <laughs> That's all I've got to say. <laughs> but yeah, but I mean, Frankie, Frankie was a, you mentioned he was a, a tough man. He was a, a great fighter. Um, tell, us a little bit, I, I tell, us a, tell us a little bit about the boxing before we look at the, the crime. Tell us about well, you and Frankie were both fighters. Yeah, well... You know, I keep going back to this area where survival is very, very important. And I have the greatest respect for boxers because I know that um, a guy who gets into the ring, he's got to have plenty, plenty bottle. Mm. If he gets in again, I mean, I've known people to get into the ring once and never go back again. It's a nightmare. But when you get people going back and back and back, 
proves their character. Whether they were champions, there's a lot of good fighters who were never champions. Yeah. But it goes back um, 1840, and um, I had a relation who was world champion. And in the bare knuckle days, this guy was called Tom Sears. Tom Sears came from south. Um, I think he was a bricklayer by trade. And um, this is all in the, in the history books now, of course. And um, he was British champion. Tough, tough days. He was only a small fella, but he used to fight heavyweight. And he ended up fighting for the world title against a fella called John C. Heenan, who was the American champion. In those days, the English champion fought the American champion. There was no, nobody else used to fight sort of from different countries. And whoever won that was the world champion. Um, again, it was illegal, which runs in the family. Everything's <laughs> illegal. It was illegal to be a fighter in those days, but they fought at Farn Farnsborough and they fought to a draw and they both were given belts. And I think that's where the, the boxing in our family comes from because, you know, we always used to read, I used to read books, you know, all my life I used to read boxing books. I love boxing. It was part of my life. still is. And um, what he achieved, you know, um, w was remarkable. So when I was a kid and my brother Frank um, decided to box, um, he was a good fighter, Frank, yeah. you know. I mean, you'll always get people saying, oh, he was good, he could have been this, he could have been this, but I really mean it, Frank, he was a good fighter. Mm -hmm. But like all fighters, and any fighter will tell you this, it doesn't matter how good you are, if you've got a bad manager, the kid will not get anywhere because you need a good manager. A good manager with an average fighter will get him somewhere to the top. But if you get a bad manager and a good fighter, it, it just, you just lose it. So what was happening, this guy from Blackpool, um, Jim Turner, I think he was called, mm -hmm. um, Frankie boxed, boxed bantamweight, I think, boxed featherweight, maybe nine, nine four. And this kid was, um, this, this manager he had was overmatching him and he was fighting kids half a stone heavier, you know. So he got disillusioned, basically, which happens with fighters, they get disillusioned, you know, and they just lose interest. So that's what happened with Frank, unfortunately. But I've no doubt that he would have been at least British champion because mm -hmm. he had plenty of guts and plenty of ball and he was a good fighter. So Frankie to me was like a role model, you know. Like when I was a kid, I thought, I'd like to be like him, you know. I'd like to, I'd like to be a, a fighter. And that was so, from an early age, I wanted to be a fighter and, um, I had, um, I think I had about 40 fights, and um, I won most of them, so I, I was pretty good. And it's no good me sitting here telling you how good I was, yeah. because that's something I shouldn't do. But if you speak to people who were around at the time, there's not so many around that did, they would have told you I was... I was good. I I've, was. Um, I've seen a few of the cuttings, Albert, and I mean, yeah. you know, when you look through them, you know, yeah. they say that you were, you know, you, you won a lot of awards, yeah. especially for your style. Yeah. Well, I was. I think at my weight, because I, I boxed for a select team, and what, what they did in them days, if you're the best featherweight in the northeast, you boxed for this select team, which I did, and as I, as I say. Um, uh, you know, my idea was always like, I'd like to turn pro and I would love, you know, kids today talk about winning world titles, but Lonsdale belt in those days was special. It was something special, still, yeah. Still is today. Yeah. Great achievement to win a Lonsdale belt. And quite honestly, I, 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 I know that I was good enough. I know that I had quality. I know I could fight. And, and it's like, looking at a football or a racehorse, 
you know if they've got natural talent and and I did have natural talent but um, what happened was uh, a great character at the time a fellow who was well known a guy called Joe Lyle Joe Lyle had the 69 club um, very well known nightclub at the time and Joe was from our environment came up the ladder you know used to be on selling and buying and in the car trade and the kid ended up a wealthy wealthy man a very nice fella by the way never forgot himself and um, at the time they used to have professional boxing at the Gossel Park Hotel and Joe said to me you know I'll better fancy going into the promoting part of the game and I'd like to have you as my main fighter because you're a local man. Everybody knows you. You're doing very, very well. Um, and I could promote you and, and see what happens. But it, I needed to get a license. And when I went to get a professional license, they said my, my eyes were probably not good enough, you know. So that was another dream. Went out of the window, you know, unfortunately. So it's a big resentment resentment with me but as I say fighters in the family a uh, nephew of mine through Sutherland Hiram uh, Greenwell another good fighter who could have been a good pro things happen they just get disillusioned I think with different things it's you know tough, what I mean? it's a tough tough sport tell us a little bit about um, St James's Boxing Hall it's somewhere which I unfortunately never got a chance to, to ever visit or go to but it was it was on the other side of the road from the football stadium what was it like to go in there and you know sample the boxing and the wrestling and, and what it was great and in, in 1964 used to have the championships up there and I boxed in 1964 at St James's Hall and it was a marvellous thing because I had heard the old fighters telling me about St James's Hall you know all the great fighters Wrong, uh, fought, fought up it there. At St James's Hall, Newcastle, Teddy Gardner in the darker shorts challenges Terry Allen for his British flyweight title. It's a needle match between two clever fighters. And there was a pal of mine, an old Jewish fella, Yiddish fella called Jaime Gordon, an old time fighter. And then there's 20 rounder, you know. And he would tell me about the times in the hall, you know, like. Um, uh, guys were fighting f to live basically and there was a referee up there an old time referee and they reckon that when, when two guys were fighting if one went down he used to say to them get up or you'll not get paid you know <laughs> whether the guy was dying or he was hurt get up or you don't get paid might have got two quid for the fight so St James's was a it was a marvellous place for boxing, a hotbed of boxing in the northeast. And um, as it got on, all, all the chaps used to go to the to the fights. That was part of it. Like guys got to football matches today, but we used to all go to the boxing matches. Seen some good fighters up there as well. And um, Morris Cullen, um, who was British and European champion. His manager wanted to take me under his wing at one time, by the way, but that's another story. Um, so the guy who used to promote at St. James's was a fellow called Joe Shepard. And um, a nice fella. What happened with the, with the chaps, the boys, is there was turnstiles in those days when you went into the, into the arena and um, one of us used to pay and we used to just keep passing the ticket back and forward. So there's about 40 we used to get in. <laughs> 40 got in on one ticket. And Joe, Joe had said to Apollo, he says, I don't understand this. He says, it's packed. But he says, when I looked at the receipts, he says, I've lost money on the job, you know. <laughs> and there were just little things like that, which were nice little things, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, it was a great place, some great fighters, great fighters from there. Mm. And De so we'll miss it, you know, I think we'll yeah. miss them things, you know. Definitely, definitely. Um, to, going back to the, you know, the, the, the store, once you were established on, on Savile Row, um, what, was it, what was it like up there for, for you working the borough, legally at last? 
It was a nice feeling and I liked it, but I missed, I missed the old times, you know. I've always been a guy who goes back to the old times because I always think the old times were, and even the first few years when we were working a straight pitch on Savile Row, mm -hmm. I used to keep looking over my shoulder like that for the old bill because I, I couldn't get used to it, you know. Mm -hmm. I couldn't get used to being legal. Mm -hmm. And... Um, it was different because you got customers coming and then you got a regular clientele. I mean, I had some customers, um, they came and, and many, many years later, the daughters would come or the sons would come and they used to say, you know, Mr. Says, I used to come here with my mum when I was five. And they're, they're nice little things, you know. Mm. On the other hand, you got customers, um, who used to come to the barrow and some well-known people, by the way, whose name I won't mention, but they used to come to the barrow and they were very friendly with me and used to buy the fruit there because I did sell very, very good fruit. It was the best. Nobody sold better stuff than me. And, um, and then all of a sudden in the Even Chronicle, they'd be showing about the Sears family mm -hmm. and then they'd stop coming. And I thought that was rather, um, you know, it, it didn't say a lot for that person, did it really? You know, because, like, I'm very, very proud of my name, Sears. We've achieved a lot in our lives, you know. People tend to think, oh, they're just criminals, you know, they're just gangsters, you know, they're just people that um, you should be a little bit afraid of, but that isn't that isn't the case, you know. I mean, if I look at my nephews now, they've all done well. Um, John Henry's a straight businessman, he does well, he, he's, he knows what he's about, he's a good businessman. Stephen's doing very well, he's turned a leaf and he's, um, with your help, he's He's wrote some good books, there's been some good, um, and there's a film going to be made about him shortly. So all of those things are good. Um, Sylvia, her kid, um, he's in the building trade now, and I think he's got 20 men working for him. So those are parts that people don't see, Yeah. you know. Um, but having said that, I'm not ashamed of um, anything that my family's done in the past. And I think we can look to the future, which is a nice thing, you know. Take us through an average working day on the on the pitch. What was you know what time were you having to get up when you were when you were working on? Oh, it was hard. It was very very hard. Like you, you'd be up at sort of five in the morning, and then the guy who used to work for me used to pick me up in the van because I never I never drove. Mm -hmm. That's quite strange, isn't it? Were you born to be driven? Yes. <laughs> and another thing that I'm quite unique about is I, I don't have a telephone. You don't have a mobile? I don't have a mobile. No. How many people in England haven't got a fucking mobile phone? <laughs> <laughs> you tell me. Is there uh, a particular I, reason yes. you don't have a mobile yes. phone? Why is yes. that? I think that phones are very intrusive, you know. And I, I like that little bit of um, I like that little bit of space, and um, there's a lot of reasons, but that's one of them, you know. You don't have a cash card either. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> get back to your working day then. So you would get up at five. Steve wasn't it? Who used to work with you, Steve, Steve Baxter? Steve used to pick me up, yeah, mm -hmm. and um, we'd go over to the market. This was the new market. Where Not was that? This was in, um, in Gateshead. Yeah. Because we went fr from the old market to the new market in 1968. Right. Um, because of redevelopment in Newcastle City Centre. The new market was never the same and never had the atmosphere really, but it was okay. And so from five o'clock, we'd be over there at six o'clock and... Um, then it was a, a matter of um, going around different stalls, 
seeing what was good, what was bad, what you wanted to buy, you had to buy it at the right price to sell it at the right price. So there's a lot of work involved before you even go back to the pitch. And then um, we'd buy and, and load it into the van and then take it back to the pitch, unload, flash up as we call, call it, you know, display. And that in itself was very artistic because if you look at, if you look at a fruit pitch, you know, you've got to, it's all experience, you've got to know, you can't just dump a lot of stuff onto a barrel, you know, you've got to have your greens and your reds and your yellows, it's very artistic. I always knew I was an artistic fella, <laughs> but that is, that is the case. And, and then we went on until about seven o'clock at night selling, so can you imagine? Long, long days, you know, and... Um, but that was the way it was. It was never easy. The mm -hmm. game was never easy. From, from my grandmother's time to my mother's time. I mean, my mother, God rest her soul, she worked her pitch on Percy Street on the Saturday night and she died on the Sunday morning. You know, and we never had holidays. Our families never had holidays. Mm -hmm. um, it was just part of the routine. You, you just worked, you know. It was all about work. And mentioning old Mariah, who's a very, very interesting character, you know, she was like um, Catherine Cookson, sort of. Matriarchal female yeah. figure. Yeah. She used to have the pinny on, grey hair tied back, and she used to snuff. You don't see people snuffing the day, do you? No. <laughs> I mean, they put stuff up their nose, but they don't put mm -hmm. put snuff up their nose, you know, which she, which she did. And um, she had the concession for the cooperative stores. The cooperative stores in those days was based in Stowell Street. You know, Rose's bar on the corner, just facing there, on the same side, was the cooperative stores, and any overflow she got was quite lucrative, you know. Um, they had the banana rooms there, and she used to get the bananas. And in those days, you probably haven't seen there were the packers packing in them days was different. They had the big wooden boxes, which was all like a coffin with a lid on. And you got 28 pound of bananas in those um, boxes, but me old, Granny, she had the, the ripeners straightened up in the rooms, so they used to put 40 pounds of bananas in instead of 25 bananas. So she was in front straight away, you see. And then if you go into Blackfriars, the land from Blackfriars to the Dulce Vita was all her land, and it was a proper farmyard, actually. There isn't many photographs which still exist. I happen to have one, actually, um, of the warehouse. But remembering it as a kid, there was um, it, there were all white stone buildings, and there were like stables. You know, there was horses and yeah. there was geese and animals running around. In fact, there was an article in the paper saying the, the farmhouse in Newcastle. So all the fruit was delivered there, and then you'd have about ten or twelve different guys selling bring the barrows and they used to get 10 of that, 10 of that, 10 of that, all my eyes to give them the stuff. And then they used to go to the different pitches and sell, you know. So she was she was the governor, you know. She she was really, really, um, really a clever woman, you know. Um, but as the years went on, you know, unfortunately, she had bad times as well as, as the good times she had. and. Um, once she died, she didn't die with a lot of money, unfortunately, but she was a great, great person, you know. And you remember these people, you know, because it's a tapestry, you know, life is a tapestry, isn't it? And you remember these colours and, and these blues and these yellows and people represent the blues and the yellows of your life. And she was very, very um, important in my life. I was... I was one of her favourites of the grandkids. Mm. And when she used to get deliveries, I remember in the summer, she always had a box of, a box of strawberries. She used to come and wick her baskets in them days with a handle. That's for my laddie, she used to say. <laughs> 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 he spoiled us a little bit. But 
my wife spoils me, my mom spoils me, you know, so I suppose I've always been spoiled one way or another. Getting back to your pitch on Northumberland Street, one of the signs I always remember you having up on there was, um, please do not handle the fruit. Um, yeah, I is that one of your pet hits? Yeah, I used to get the right needle. As I got older, I got more cantankerous, obviously. <laughs> So my patience went out of the window, you know. But um, I heard the people handling fruit because, uh, first of all, when you handle fruit, and if you ask any of these lads who know about the fruit game, they'll tell you. Um, Ray Winston, the the actor, used to work the barriers, I believe, and I remember him saying to the punter, don't touch the fruit, madam, don't touch the fruit, you damage it, which is what happens. If you can imagine an apple being squeezed 100 times a day, obviously it gets damaged. Yeah. And then plus you take the health part of it into it, you know. So I used to get the needle, probably I was wrong, you know. <laughs> Just an old man getting... Contangerous, that's all it was, I suppose. I've got to be honest, when I used to come up there and watch you have a... I used to give some bollocks. Oh, the bollocks. I used to dread seeing someone picking up an yeah, orange I, or an apple. I used to give some bollocks. <laughs> I, I had more fights than any street trader than Newcastle, I think. You also had a bit of publicity, and I've got to be honest, as you know, we look through your photograph albums, which are fascinating. You, you know, you mentioned style. I think style seems to run through your life, mm. whether it's putting up a good flash or whether it's wearing the suit as a young kid and having it made for you as a, as a you know, as a teenager. Um, but I think from, from your perspective, I think, you know, it's um, the, st the style the style side of it, it just seems to be a big part of your life, you know, and, and, and the flash in particular. Yeah, absolutely. And publicity, absolutely. you were always good with publicity, looking through, Great. The, looking through the photographs. I was fantastic with publicity. Yeah, yeah. tell us, tell us, tell us you know, about the, the ring that was found. Well, that was an old one, that one. Um, business wasn't too good, I remember. Things were really, really hard, you know. It was like what we call kipper days, you know what I mean? <laughs> it, was, it was hard. So I was selling strawberries one day and, and I thought to myself, because publicity is good, even bad publicity is good, you know, but I was great at publicity. And I happened, excuse me, I happened to find a gold ring, a wedding ring amongst the strawberries. Now, ask me if I really found it or I put it there myself, I'm, I'm taking the fifth. <laughs> but well, needless to say, I got quite a lot of coverage over that. Yeah. And they had to call Sherlock Holmes in and, and, and find out the people who had packed it and they were asking all the people had they lost a wedding ring and um, so it, it, it went on quite a long time that one, that was a nice story that one, yeah. No, yeah. It's, it's, it is a good one. So, you know, what I, what I used to do, you, you create these things that people like to read about, mm. they don't always like to read about gloom, which is what we're having to deal with this virus. They like to find little things like that, which is interesting and funny, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we're missing today. We're missing the humour out of life, you know? Yeah. Frankie and John, as I, as I mentioned earlier, went down a different path. They, did, they, went, yeah. down, they went down the life of, of crime. And mm -hmm. uh, there, was well, big, there was a big incident in Newcastle, which is, which is quite historic, the Battle of mm -hmm. Percy Street. Tell us, tell us a, a, as much as you can, or as much as you want to, about that. Well, I was only, I was only a kid at the time, and um, you know, I've, I've got to say that the family involved, we had been sort of very, very friendly with these people because they were from street trading um, people as well, the Finleys and. Um, I still get on very well with the family, you know, um, some nice people amongst them. But at, at the time, the nightlife in Newcastle, you had the Dolce Vita, you had the Emersons, Billy Bodos, clubs were thriving, you know what I mean? In them days, you had to wear a collar and tie before you went into a club. 
There had been a, an occasion as I heard that my brother John had been in the Dolce Vita, I think, and um, he had come out of the Dolce Vita and um, worse the way, because John was a big drinker, Horace was a big drinker. And um, these three guys had said about him, you know, took a right liberty, you know. And one of them happened to be um, one of the Finleys, you know. And um, the aftermath was the Battle of Percy Street, which it's well documented. And so there was retaliation from our family and um, a lot of our pals who we knew, but Kenny Anderson, who's dead now, God rest his soul, and um, different guys, you know, who were close to the family, and um, they weren't looking for these people who were taking the liberty, and um, the problem was solved, you know. There was a lot of axes and chains used, I suppose, and a lot of um, violence used, and. Um, it ended up that my family were in the dock because the other family prosecuted them, you know, which was probably the wrong thing to do. You know, it had happened and it should have just been forgotten about, you know, but um, anyway, Frankie and John and, and the lads got nicked and um, the judge, remember, in his summing up said that if the Sears had a prosecuted instead of the other family, the other family would be in the dock instead of the Sears family. But that was never, that was never our way of life. You know, we kept stung. We, we never, um, to this day. You know, I mean, you, if you look at my nephews, John, the sentences he's had: fifteen years. Um, Stephen Tens, I think he said, and Michael's had a twelve. You know, these people are so and so and people. If they get nicked for something, they take it on the chin like a man and they say, right, okay. Whether it's right or wrong, whether the police are right or wrong, and a lot of the times the police are wrong, the system is wrong, and they um, can fabricate certain things. But again, that's another story. So that that's what happened, and and at the time it was headlines in the papers. You know what I mean? There was a lot of um, at the time there was a lot of bad blood between the two families. But as the years went on, things got smoothed over again. Time's a great healer. Yeah, um, I think so. Yeah. Well, there are you know incidents, I suppose, that, that stand out in in the nineteen sixties are the Cray twins, of course, were well known yeah. in London. Well, I was um, a, I was a kid actually when they came up, but the thing that happened with me, I was I was using the clubs when I was seventeen. Yeah. And um, the reason for that being is like, I would be with my brother Frankie, brother John, brother Peter. Um, pals of ours, you know, um, um, Dennis O'Donnell, nice fella, straight fella, um, Bobby Tate and different guys and, and Panda and all those people. And we used to go to all the clubs and I was very, very, um, I was like a little, I looked young in my age, Perry Como, do you remember Perry? Yes, Wouldn't... I know who he is. <laughs> and I used to have the haircut, Perry Como haircut. Um, and I I used to look very, very young for my age. Mm -hmm. And I I was boxing at the time, 17. So the, the guys in them days, if there was a queue of people waiting to go to a nightclub, we used to walk straight and never have appeared in any nightclub. Billy Bartow's nightclub, Manny Burgo used to be on the door, nice fella. Old Manny Burgo the gra would be the grandfather. Yeah. Good fighter as well. Um, and we walked straight in, you know what I mean? We were all as well looked after drinks came over and everything. And um, Emerson's or, or Joe Lyle's club, 69 club, never ever paid. We all as walked in and, and, and we were well looked after. There's a lot of folklore 
you know, and a lot of things and a lot of stories which have been said about them, you know what I mean? Um, the, the, the head policeman at the time, head busy at the time, was a fellow called Vinton, I think, Jack Vinton, he was the head detective. So as soon as they came into Newcastle, Remember, Newcastle is a village compared to London. As soon as they stepped off the train at the central station, the old Bill knew that they were in town, you know what I mean? And the story that, um, that goes around that they went to the 69 Club and then Joe Lyle give Panda a thousand pound to give to them as a sweetener, that was a lot of nonsense because Joe Lyle told me just a little a few years, he's only been dead about two years, Joe, but I had an occasion to have a drink with Joe and he said to me, you know, but he says, that was a lot of bollocks. He says, I never give anybody any money. He says, and one of the points was, he says, Pan Anderson was barred from my club, so how could I give him a grant to give to the twins? Mm -hmm. Joe had plenty of bottle, by the way, plenty of bottle. So, if the craze, which I believe did go to the 69 club, and whether they got in and Joe threw them out, I'm not sure. But I know Joe wouldn't stand for any nonsense. He had plenty, plenty of bottle, Joe, whether it was the Cray twins or anybody else. I mean, you know, there's a lot of things said about the Cray twins. And the, I'm a great believer that you come from an environment, mm. you end up what that environment is. And they came from a tough area, and um, they were tough guys. But knowing some of the criminals that I've known over the years, people that my father knew, my brother Frankie knew, they weren't a good class of criminal, if you understand what I mean. You know, like you've got Freddie Foreman and them, these are quality guys, you know what I mean? Um, Paul Ferris, people like that, these are quality guys. People who have got, um, they don't cross over certain lines. Of course, the craze did and they were bullies and I don't like bullies. Um, but that's my personal opinions. So they, if they come up here and they wanted to start messing people about, there was plenty of people who could have sorted them out. Mm. My brother Frankie being one of them, mm. because Frankie was, at the time he was working with um, um, Dennis Stafford and he was working with um, Vince. So, he, you know, he, he was a handy man to have around Frank. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wouldn't, the craze wouldn't have made any difference to him. And I could mention another four or five people who wouldn't have stood any nonsense from them. Mm. You know, they were, they were only as tough as what they were. You know, and it's like any fighter, if they're giving it all the time, they're great, but when it comes back for the other way around, basically, they, they wouldn't have stood it too much. So they didn't win any, any medals up here. You mentioned Dennis Stafford, obviously. Yeah. Dennis and Michael Lavaglio uh, yeah. um, were obviously part of a, a, an infamous case up well, here. Well, had, they had the Piccadilly Club at yeah. the time, which we used to use in Bath Lane. As I say, um, all of the chaps used all of those clubs, you know, um, and the Piccadilly was one of them. I was about, as I say, I must have been very young, 17, 18. So I got to know Dennis, who, who I liked very, very much, Dennis. Um, Vince, not too much. Vince was a, um, a kind of guy you liked or you didn't like, you know. Um, what can I say? He, he wasn't the man that I would like to sit down and have a glass of wine with, where Dennis was, you know. Because Dennis, again, was from our environment. Mm -hmm. You know, Dennis came up the tough way, and um, um, I, met his, I met his father on a couple of occasions. I'm sure that Joe, they lived in Judge Street, I think, on um, King's Cross. But anyway, Dennis was a nice guy, and... Um, Again, it's documented that there was um, a problem with Sibbett and Sibbett was murdered and um, Dennis got time for it, didn't he? Dennis and Michael, you know. Now, Michael, as a case there, Michael was the opposite to any, any of the street guys because he was a very, very timid guy, you know, very, very timid. 
In fact, at the time he lived in Chelsea Grove, which was just facing the 69 club. And every night when he was finished at the club, my brother Frankie had to take him home, go into the house, look around the house to see that everything was right for him, you know? So he, how he could be um, accused of murdering somebody is, to me, really is ridiculous, you know? Mm -hmm. But that again, that's the system, it's worse, isn't it, you know? If there's a crime committed, they want somebody for that crime, whether they're guilty or they're not guilty. It doesn't make any difference. Mm -hmm. the, the system is not something that I like very much because it, it doesn't work the way it should work. You know, that's why, you, that's why you've got these food uh, banks today, you know? Um, God blame me. They, Two th yeah, 2000, and you know, we've got food banks. Yeah, 2020. Doesn't, doesn't make sense, does it? Yeah, it's crazy. You know, when you think of the money that um, that these people are spending, these governments are spending, you know, and, and you've got food banks. Crazy. You, and talk, the, you talk about the system, Albert. Um, let's look at your nephews, John, Stephen and Michael. Yeah, you mentioned the sentences. You know, they've, mm. they've had some pretty hefty sentences. Um, why do you think, you know, the... But just to interrupt you, Stephen, yeah. which I'm sorry, mm. but when they had the sentences, they, they, they took it like men. Yeah. And I've got to emphasise that. They, they didn't cry and, and, and complain about what had happened to them. They took it on the shoulders like men, and that's a sign of a man for me. Why do you think the police have targeted the... This year's family. I think if you go to any city in England, London, Manchester, Leeds, any of the big cities, you'll always get families that the police will um, focus on. And, you know, it just goes back to the American Mafia or any of those big families that the, the, the police say, right, there was a crime committed, that must be the Sears's. There was a crime committed last week, that must be the Sears's. Without any evidence whatsoever, but most of the times that the boys have been nicked, there hasn't been a lot of evidence against them, but their name takes them forward. Mm. And that's sad. That's very, very sad. I've got to be honest, you know, the burning of the barrels when I was a young kid was a fantastic time. Um, all my family had run the barriers in the city centre, you know. My day would consist of getting up first thing in the morning, going to the market, it was my Uncle Albert, coming back, to, coming back down the town, flashing up, and basically standing on the lamppost most of the, rest, most of the day, looking for police officers coming because the barriers were illegal at the time. Uh, from the police? Any amount, any amount. So I used to see my Uncle Albert getting dragged off the pitch, arms up his back. You know, he was just trying to get a living at the end of the day, you know. I always wanted to. I always wondered if I had my way, I'd be a barber boy now. I'd work the barber for the rest of my life. But unfortunately, I can't get a licence. Um, I could get, I could work in that shop there. I could work in that shop, but I can't work on the barber. For what reason, you know, you need a licence to work here. We don't need a licence to work 20, 15 foot across there. Strange, very strange, but that's, that's the law and you've got to abide by the rules. Sometimes. Yeah. I mean, even in my life, I'm, I'm experiencing problems because of my name, you know? Um, as you know, I'm retired from the fruit business now, but I've decided that I'm going to open a business, um, a food business, selling pizzas. Um, the normal procedure is that you would apply for a license, that you would go in front of a committee and they would decide whether you should have it or yes or no. My applications went on three years. I've never received a letter or any confirmation whatsoever from them. Now, this doesn't happen. You've got that big organisation, the shack, which used to be where the Odeon is. They've just had a licence granted them for the, for the next three years. So the committees are working and they are giving people licences. Why, have, why haven't I been given a licence whether they say yes or no to my application. Why? Because I'm a serious. Simple as that. And other things that I won't mention, which has happened um, with 
um, different people, you know, system again, it just your name goes before you, not the person you are or what you've achieved. The name goes before you. And that's something that you've just got to, it's a stigma and you've got to carry it. But you've got to carry it proudly and you've got to be proud. Because that's the way to beat the system. Never put your head down. You know, never go down. When I was boxing, even when I was hurt, never ever went down. If a guy was killing me and you really, really hurt, you know, just that little bit of something in your belly which tells you, look, God, no, don't lie down, go on. Whether you get beat or you don't get beat, just go on and go on and go on. And that's the way we are, man. You know, we're, we're a strange animal, I suppose, aren't we? Mm -hmm. You know? But as I say, when I talk about tribes, see, we've got a different culture, you know? And don't make any mistake about it, I have a great um, respect for the working man because the working man goes to work and um, it's hard, um, you know, looking after a family and bringing a family up. I've got nothing against them. But what I'm saying, the work of man's mentality is a different mentality to what, what people like myself would have, you see. And so that's the way it is, you just accept. Who in society today doesn't bend a little? You know, if a guy works in a paint shop, do you think he pays for the paint that he paints his house with? I don't think so. The guy who works in the bakers, does he pay for his bread? I don't think so. So it doesn't matter who you talk about, people have a little bit of that, the bend a little bit, you know what I mean? So there's nobody, nobody straight. And so, you say he's a criminal, but he's not a criminal. I mean, you've got the MPs, for instance, we'll use them as an example, good example. They've all been at, not all of them, but a lot of them have been at the nonsense with their expenses. Mm -hmm. Now, these are, these are role models to us. These are people that we should look up to and say, God, blame me, he, he's running the country, basically, and, and yet, the, the nonsense with their expenses. So is he a straight man or is, he a, or is he a thief? If a man steals a pencil or a penny, he's a thief, isn't he? So you can't put whatever hat you want on it. Everybody's at it, Steve. Everybody's at it. You any, know. any regrets? No, I haven't. I haven't. Any, any regrets? Um, if you ask me if I would change my life, I wouldn't. Um, I miss a lot of people who have died. I miss my mom and my dad, who I loved very, very much. I miss Frank, Sylvia, my granny Mariah, all of those people who were so very, very important to me. I've been fortunate because um, I've got a good, f wonderful family. I've got a beautiful wife um, who looks after me very well. I've got a beautiful daughter who's educated, went to university. She's a clever girl. Um, they love me. I love them. I haven't got a lot of money, but I'm happy. What, what can I say? Albert, yes. Thank you. Okay, Steve. Okay, pleasure. Oh, 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 o